Good afternoon, everybody. Can everybody hear me all right? Hopefully. I was told earlier to speak loud, right? And, and, and the uh, AV people here told me, they suggested that I speak as if I'm speaking over my kids. So I won't scream that loud, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today on this special occasion. A special thanks to uh, Mayor Walsh, uh, Chris Cook, Heather Capasano, and Jonathan Greeley, uh, and other city officials and representatives that I may have, may have missed. I uh, appreciate your attendance here today. Uh, my name my name is Charlie Leatherby. I uh, have the distinct pleasure of running the development operations here in, in Boston. So, you know, it's funny. About a decade ago, uh, it's hard to remember, but a decade ago, this whole area was known as the, the mud lots. I'm sure some of you uh, remember that. And if you look at it now, this neighborhood truly has uh, evolved and become a lively, bustling neighborhood. Years ago, uh, Boston Global Investors and a handful of other developers had a vision for the seaport. I'm proud to say that Skanska uh, invested in that vision. With our first acquisition in 2011, uh, Watermark Seaport, uh, to, my, to my left here, a 346-unit multifamily project that we delivered in uh, 2015. Uh, we have, since that, that point, we've, we've actually completed now three projects, Watermark, 101, and 121, which I'll talk about in a moment. And we're embarking on our fourth project in the seaport, Two Dry Dock, which is a 225,000 square foot office building to our east in the Dry Dock District. We're thrilled, absolutely thrilled, to open the doors of 121 Seaport and welcome its tenants, PTC and Alexion, as they call 121 their new headquarters. With each project that we deliver, we aim to contribute to the public realm in a sustainable manner that respects and adds vibrancies to the neighborhoods in which we are working. As some may or may not know or may recall, in late May in 2016, I was sitting at my desk and the entire development and construction team walked up, approached me and said, can you come in the conference room? Now, for those of you who are familiar with development and construction or work in that industry, that's never, never, ever a good sign when you have that many people pulling you into the conference room. So I walked into the conference room and I was informed that the construction crews hit a boat, literally just hit a boat. I said, well, what do you mean you hit a boat? How do you hit a boat? And, and my first thought was, okay, so maybe some construction equipment backed into a boat on a trailer? No, that wasn't the case. In fact, Further on, they, 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 they described to me that they actually uncovered a boat in the excavation of this building here at 121 Seaport. So they led me over to the, to the conference room. I looked out the window and I peered down into a 30 foot wild hole, a 30 foot deep hole. And there I saw the outline of a hull of a ship right in the middle of, of our, our foundation systems. Now after a number of jokes, some very colorful, colorful uh, commentary, and, and once the, the shock settled in, we kind of looked at each other and we said, okay, well, now what? what? What do we do? We had a building we had to deliver. We had an incredibly aggressive timeline, but we also wanted to do the right thing. Now, the entire ship fell within our property. There's a lot of things that we could have done, but we chose to stop, ascertain the situation, and figure out what we're going to do next. Thankfully, with a great team of people, uh, led by Joe Bagley here, who's the uh, city's archaeologist, we realized that there's a history here and there's something that could be done and should be done. So we delicately and carefully extracted the boat for further study. We wanted to honor the discovery in a meaningful way that fit in Boston's larger legacy uh, of history. And that's one of the many things that makes this city so special. So that is how effectively we created Harbor Way, this pedestrian promenade here that everyone, that is open to, to the public to enjoy led by the renowned local landscape architecture firm of Copley Wolf Design Group. Our design team included a number of consultants, one of which is Trivium uh, Interactive, who uses media and technology in a wonderfully creative ways to tell stories. The outcome of that collaborative work is the interactive walking museum at Harbor Way, which includes a digital library of historic photos, maps, information, and a phone app with augmented reality functions that educate visitors about the seaport's history from the time when the area was a tidal flat through its evolution of industrial presence to today's seaport, Boston's newest neighborhood. Our hope is that when people come and visit the seaport, they stop at Harbor Way to learn a few things and enjoy the outdoor space. Building upon the great work delivered by WS Development, the pedestrian environment will expand further as the seaport, further in the seaport as WS continues with its great plans it has in stores. We look forward to seeing the seaport evolve further as they write the seaport's next chapter. In addition, Harbor Way 
In addition to Harbor Way, today we also celebrate the completion of 121 Seaport, a building that I personally, on behalf of Skanska, am incredibly proud of. Its unique design was born out of form and function. We pushed ourselves to deliver something different, which resulted in one of the city's most efficient and sustainable buildings in Boston. And lastly, I'm pleased to recognize the great retail establishments that now call Seaport their home. In particular, I'd like to welcome Cardulos, a local family-owned and operated market as the newest neighborhood in the Seaport. And with that, it's my honor to introduce Mayor Walsh. Mr. Mayor, we're grateful to have you here today to celebrate. Thank you, Charlie. And let me thank um, everyone from Skanska. Uh, I can imagine the day that you were called in the conference room, you nearly had a heart attack when you saw the boat down there. Uh, but um, thank you for all you did there. And, and um, Joe's going to talk in a few minutes about, about the boat, about the ship. Uh, I also just want to introduce and thank a few people that are here. Uh, we have uh, our new Chief of Arts and Culture, Cara, Cara Elliott Ortega, is here with us. Thank you, Cara. Where are you? Somewhere. Thank you, Cara. Um, Cara's worked in that office almost since the beginning, and um, she, she was, been, was the acting chief and was, was elevated to the chief uh, last Friday, so congratulations. Uh, we also have the chief of staff, my chief of staff, Dave Sweeney, with us. Thank you, Dave, for being with us. Um, chief, Health Human, chief of um, Environment, Chris Cook. Thank you, Chris. I drew a little brain freeze there for a minute, sorry. Um, I want to thank Jeremy Sklar as well. I just did a walk around the community with Jeremy. Uh, and uh, we literally walked around the neighborhood, and, and, and the key word there is neighborhood, uh, because if we walked around this area five years ago, we walked around an area five years ago that was building buildings, and today it truly is turning into a neighborhood. Uh, so I want to thank Jeremy and his team and all the great things that they do, and Skanska, obviously. Thank you, Skanska. And to all of you that are here today, thank you for coming. Uh, it's exciting to see the Harbor Way opened up. Uh, it represents, it's going to represent a great new pedestrian prominent uh, street level rails, green space, uh, it's going to improve walkability, sustainability, a sense of community and it's the next step in really having a true open area in the Seaport, Seaport District. Uh, as, as we develop more here, you're going to be able to walk all the way to Sumner Street, uh, you're going to be able to, we'll be able to get around accessible around the waterfront, around the South Boston waterfront, which is really exciting. Uh, we're going to be also here on this spot here, great new pedestrian promenade, street level uh, retail, green space and I know there's a lot of people here today uh, and I can't start naming you because if I do I'll get in trouble but there's a lot of great business owners right here with us today under this tent uh, that are working for new companies now or going to be open to new companies and just make sure that if and if you're an employee here make sure that you visit them all because they, a lot of these companies are not national chains they're small individuals and owners who are putting their life savings into an opportunity to be successful so as you're going around just make sure you give them a shot as well. Uh, the seaport is, is one of the most dynamic neighborhoods in the city. Uh, its, its industries are growing down here. Uh, there's big employers and small employers. Uh, there's opportunities that are happening down here. Um, soon it's going to be home to one of the most beautiful, accessible parks in our city, Martins Park, uh, which is right, right behind me. Uh, we're building a, a brand new playground there, a fully 100% accessible without making a big deal about it. So kids that go in there and play, uh, there's no signs and there's no, you play over here and you play over there. They'll be able to access whatever t type of equipment they want to access and really be able to enjoy it. And that park is, has us starting to think about in how we're designing our own parks around the city so we make all of our parks accessible so the parents don't have to go to a special place for their kids. They can actually take them down the street. So I want to thank Chris Cook and the Parks Department for that. Uh, when people think about the seaport, they think about the future. Uh, I'm glad that the Harbor Walk is also going to offer us ways to celebrate the maritime past. Uh, the Seaport Shipwreck Museum is, preserves an amazing piece of Boston's history. It adds edu an educational component, and it's, uh, it also, as this neighborhood evolves, it will help us connect our past. Uh, when I was a kid or a teenager, um, my first construction job I ever worked on uh, was down here at the Cromwell Pier, which is now the World Trade Center. It was gutted. It was empty. Uh, and as I was down there, you learned a lot talking to the old timers about what was down here with the maritime industry and ships coming in and dropping off supplies and, and, and goods and services to our city. But also the industry of, of fishing was a big important part of that. And, and what we want to do here in the city is to make sure we continue to preserve the history while we still have a working port down the street. Uh, it's important for us to acknowledge that. Uh, but the city of Boston's archaeologist here, Joe Bagley, He's going to tell us more about uh, what Charlie talked about with this incredible discovery. Um, I'm going to end there because it's hot and you're sick of hearing me. Uh, I want to thank Skanska for their commitment to improving public access surrounding their world-class developments at 
uh, 101 Seaport, 121 Seaport, and Water Market. Without further ado, come on up here, Joe. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm here today to eulogize the ship that we found uh, two years ago. Um, so about 4.30 in the afternoon, a little over two years ago, um, I heard about this incredible archaeological discovery the old-fashioned way via a Twitter tweet. Um, and about 48 hours later, I had been invited by Skanska to join a talented team of archaeologists. I want to list some of them real fast just to acknowledge their work on the site. Um, those included Vic Mastone, our state's underwater archaeologist, David Robinson, a professional underwater archaeologist, Jonathan Patton, who's an archaeologist at the Mass Historical Commission, um, uh, independent archaeologist Paul Peranti, and an amazing team of archaeologists at PAL, the Public Archaeology Laboratory. Um, those included John DeLay, um, Jennifer Bannister, Alex Flick, and Suzanne Chereau, who's actually here today. Um, so Skanska, with no legal requirement to do so, chose to halt the work in the area of this shipwreck for three days to allow us to do um, a thorough archaeological documentation of the discovery. Under the drone of three helicopters, uh, we were able to excavate several trenches across the hull of the ship and to document its contents and thoroughly study the ship's hull and construction. So I want to summarize some of the results of what we found about this boat um, through that work and some of the ongoing work as well. The, the seaport shipwreck was a 75-foot long, two-masted schooner. We believe it was built sometime around 1800, so it's a little over 200 years old when we found it. The date comes from the position of the mast in the bow of the ship and the fact that the shipbuilders had actually used unmodified tree branches known as compass timbers to build the ship. And it probably started off its life as a fishing vessel somewhere in the New England coast. It appears that the ship did not remain a, fi a fishing vessel, though. We had found do dozens of partially burned uh, wooden barrels that contained white powdered lime. One of the barrel lids had the word Rockland painted on it, which we're very thankful that that happened because it unlocked a lot of the mystery of the ship. Um, it, that, that, ship uh, that barrel of lime revealed that the ship or originated its, its, um, its journey to Boston in Rockport, Maine. And you'll see on the, the map that's down at the other end of the site um, the journey of the ship from Rockland down to, the, down to Boston. Um, in the latter half of the 1800s, scores of ships left Rockland, Maine, the lime, hub, uh, lime making hub to supply Boston with lime uh, used in mortar, needed to rebuild Boston after the 1872 Great Fire. We had a massive building boom uh, in the 1870s to rebuild the city after it burned. Also to, burn, uh, to build the fine row houses of the newly filled Back Bay and South End neighborhoods. Unfortunately, the combination of lime and water causes a chemical reaction that results in large amounts of heats being produced. Um, enough water on lime can actually start a fire, and there are numerous written accounts of lime schooners burning out in Boston Harbor. Uh, the port and the stern of the ship that we found, as well as the ship's cargo, were heavily burned, suggesting that this type of fire actually occurred on the ship, likely leading to its sinking in the harbor. An 1869 fork that was found in the rear of the ship, along with a knife and a spoon, um, coupled with maps showing that the area had been filled in 1884, provided us with a bookend of the sinking of the ship of between 1869 and 1884. We archaeologists like to say it's not about the stuff, it's the story that the stuff tells us. Together, these artifacts and the data Skanska allowed us to record revealed a remarkable maritime story. So over 200 years ago, oak trees were felled and transformed into a 75-foot schooner with two masts in a style known as a pinky schooner. The ship joined many similar vessels in the fleet hub, uh, fishing fleets of New England. In 1870s, it was repurposed and transported and, as a transportation ship, becoming the semi-truck of its time. It left Rockland, Maine with a cargo of hundreds of lime barrels, sailing south to Boston to become the mortar of the city. Somewhere along the journey, water entered the hull, starting a fire, and the crew desperately sealed the hull in, order to, in hopes of smothering the fire. The smoldering ship arrived in Boston Harbor sometime around 1875, where it was refused access to the wharfs due to the threat of fire in the city. The ship was abandoned and towed here to the South Boston Flats, where we're all standing, um, where it was left and burned itself out. A small amount of the remaining charred hull of the ship, about 50 feet of it, was quickly covered first in tidal mud and later by many feet of fill to make land for the rapidly growing city of Boston. There it remained, uh, here it remained actually, for over 125 years, uh, converted, uh, covered by railroads, warehouses, and parking lots, until eventually being discovered by the construction crew during the building of 121 Seaport Boulevard. 
We have collected over 150 artifacts from the ship, and those are now being stored um, along with several very large fragments of the shipwreck itself at the City Archaeology Laboratory. We're welcoming researchers and anybody interested in studying the, um, the remains of the ship that are still um, being preserved. Um, and we look forward to these artifacts telling us even more about the stories that, of this piece of Boston's maritime history. Um, I'm extremely pleased to see this amazing cutting edge interpretation of the history and I'd like to thank Liz Neal and the team at Trivium who have done an incredible job adding even more information uh, to the story of this place and creating a new destination in the seaport celebrating Boston's history. I hope Boston residents and visitors enjoy this story for many years. In closing, I'd like to again to, uh, share my appreciation to Skanska for doing the right thing, for calling in archaeologists, graciously allowing us time to document this discovery and helping to document this piece of Boston's history. Thank you.